So hello everyone. Um, thank you for watching our webinar, Software Analysis with Event Annotations. I'm here with Johann Kraft from Perceptio. My name is Reinhard Keil. I'm from ORM. I'm responsible for software development tools for embedded. Our talk is about the event annotations, and we will touch on the debug and trace interfaces on Cortex M microcontrollers. I will explain the available debug techniques and the technical limitations that are available. Then we will jump into the debug annotations for high level software analysis. Um, in our tooling has a component viewer that gives you the static view to software components. We have also an, an event recorder that shows the dynamic operations and event statistics can be used to analyze the best case, worst case timing. Then we have a system analyzer that combines various timing views of the different trace sources that are available. Um, and then I will show some demonstrations and later transitioning to the part from Perceptio, where we will talk about visual trace diagnostics. This is then done by, by Johan, and he will explain how to verify the system health, timing, optimize hardware usage, finding system integration bugs quicker, even when you have long trace, and uh, visual trace diagnostics and deployed IoT devices. So the various debug and trace interfaces that you find today on Cortex M microcontrollers are summarized here in this slide. So they are based on the core side debug technology. Um, but in addition to that, I also show the UART uh, that is still a popular interface for printf style debugging. The Classic debug interface on Cortex M is JTEC or SVD based. SVD stands for serial wire debug. JTEC has four pins, serial wire debug two pins. It is a synchronous debug interface that has up to 100 megabit per second transfer rate. You can read and write memory. Even while your program is executing at full speed, you have the typical run control, so stop, go, program breakpoints. You can also use memory access breakpoints to trigger on specific accesses to your uh, variables, for example. And you can address and trace buffer either an ETB or MTD, MTB trace buffer. So this is the Standard debug interface available on all Cortex-M. In addition, an SVO trace is available. This is a one-pin trace output. Serial wire output is what SVO stands for. It extends the functionality of SVD. It uses either Manchester or user encoding. And it gives you information about events. Optionally, you can also add a timestamp to these events. So you can um, have an, an access watch to four memory locations. You get interrupt events. You have an event monitor that gives you information about wait states. So you can see if your program runs, runs slower because the flash injects wait states. And then it has various ITM boards, instrumented trace microcell is this uh, what it stands for, that allow you data output. The one pin SVO is not available on some devices. For example, the Cortex M0 does not offer this feature. The, an additional trace technology is called ETM. This is a four pin um, trace output. Typically, it could be also configured to have more data pins, but the typical configuration found in microcontrollers uses four pins and a one pin clock. It is a synchronous output and has a pretty high bandwidth. So you can um, output up to 800 megabits per second. It has all the SVO features that I have explained before, plus instruction trace and on some high-end devices, even data trace. 
not always available, only a few devices offer ETM. And it has also the caveat that it uses additional pins. So some of the devices um, share peripheral pins with it. So you might have challenges to have it with all the features configured of your device. The last technology is the classic UART output. It uses two pins, a TXT and an RXT pin. Typically runs at 115 kilo, kilobots and it is normally used for printf style debug output. Again, it requires a UART peripheral plus extra pins. So this is the caveat of it. Um, here are the summary of the technical limitations of the various technologies. So uh, JTAG SWD offers run-stop debugging. Um, when you stop the program execution, then it interferes with the system behavior, so timing cannot be analyzed. And the practical problems that you will face are that power conversion cannot be, uh, cannot be debugged with a stop, uh, a stop control because you would have situations where the supply voltage is constantly on and um, might cause overheating in your system. Then you have problems to uh, debug communication protocols because you run soon in timeouts and then uh, restart is not possible. Motor control applications have the same issue like the power conversions also here there's a likelihood that the motor overheats. So these are typical problems when you do run-stop debugging. The SWO gives you visibility to the interrupt and ITM annotations. So it gives you insight to the interrupt timing. However, there are also here practical problems. There are bandwidth limits due to relative small buffers in the core side unit. So when you have a high um, bandwidth interrupt system or many ITM events, then some got lost. And as I explained before, SWO is not available with all devices or when you run in JTAG mode. The ETM instruction trace um, gives you the insight of the uh, instruction execution. You can do execution profiling with it, which is also good for performance analyzing and code coverage. However, the output can be overwhelming for high-level system analysis because every instruction is uh, recorded and ETM is not available on several devices or the I.O. pins that are used for ETM are used for other device peripherals. So these are the caveats of it. And finally, USART printf style debugging annotations give you here insight into the application execution, but the practical problems with printf, the test and production is not identical because you would not ship an application with all the printf overhead. You have uh, an intrusive debugging because printf outputs are time consuming, so they interfere with the execution time. You can't easily annotate interrupt functions because, for example, the UART is also interrupt-driven and the various interrupts block themselves then. And when you have multi-threading applications, so typically with an RTOS, then you would need to protect the printf output, for example, with a mutex or a semaphore. Also here, um, there are limitations. Now, several years ago, we understood all these limitations and then uh, we decided that we need a better technique for high-level software analysis and we have integrated in our tooling an event recorder that allows you timing and program execution anal analysis and a component viewer that gives you static view to the operation of uh, software components. Both work with standard Cortex-M JTAG SWD interface. There is no requirement for a specific trace. It just works via memory read during program execution to capture the data. So this is the technology behind. Let me go into the technology a bit more in detail. Component viewer gives you 
um, detailed status information of software components. Here you see an example of our network stack where you have clear information about the status of this network stack. Um, it is based on an XML file um, that is pre-configured already for several, several software components, um, free RTOS, RTX and MDK middleware for example. Uh, which gives you this ready-to-use output. And it's based on status variables that are read um, from the uh, target application. Then we have the event recorder. This uh, works similar, however, slightly different. Uh, here you have actually in your application code a software component called event recorder. This records uh, events, so I will go into more details later. Uh, you can filter them. There is an event filter implemented uh, that basically discards the events that you don't care about. And then um, the events end up in an event buffer. This is in memory again, and the debugger reads this memory buffer and then displays the events on, on various places in the debug tools, which we will show later. The event buffer is configurable in size to cope with uh, event bursts, bursts that you have in your system. So when many events occur, you need a bigger buffer. Um, the typical configuration uh, starts with one kilobyte. Sometimes you need two or uh, maybe four kilobytes in your application. So for the standard Cortex-M devices that have plenty of memory these days, it's not an issue to add this software component. The event recorder shows you the dynamics of the behavior and operation, so it helps to understand RTOS, user application, and all the events that are uh, captured there. It allows you to select uh, groups or events um, at runtime. So you can actually, without recompiling your application, change the filtering. We have uh, implemented four different event categories, error, API call, operation, and detailed information. Uh, the calls are non-blocking. So the event annotations can stay in production code. There is no reason to take it out. Uh, if you are not um, aware about these events, then basically you won't uh, know where the buffer is in your system and therefore you can't reverse engineer your application code. Um, and it is supported by pretty much every debug unit. Also third-party debug units, I will go into a more detail later. Works with every Cortex-M device, so there is no restriction. We have several uh, application nodes that talk about it. Here is one example. This is the application node 320, uh, where we have used the event recorder to analyze a network performance issue. Uh, you can see here some screen captures, uh, one for the authors and one for, for a network component, where we actually see the network traffic. A variant of the event recorder is event statistics. Here you have basically start and stop events um, that work with various slots. We have uh, four different groups of these events and each group has 15 slots. The groups can be disabled again, so you can enable and disable an event group. And you can see here uh, in the mockup uh, how it is apl applied. So you call an event start and an event stop function. In between you have some user code and then um, the debug tools display you the amount, the, the number of calls, um, the minimum, maximum execution time, and then of course also the total execution time spent in this user code block. And here you have the possibility to use up to 64 different slots. Then there is a, an, another cool window called System Analyzer. This window combines the ITM and Event Recorder events uh, all together. Um, we have also a debugger that allows you to show power consumption. And you can here see in detail the timing of your events in context. So you can actually measure timing between different events. 
see the overall system reaction um, so that you can basically analyze what's going on in a complete complex system um, from the event perspective. Then we have uh, various debug units that can be used uh, to capture these events. Here we show the three typical debug units. Um, our Ulink Plus unit um, allows to also measure energy consumption. Uh, it has a pretty good data streaming capability. Of course, it's based on SWO outputs so or on the one pin trace pin. Um, we have then another unit called Ulink Pro, which is uh, also equipped with ETM as a higher trace streaming bandwidth. Um, and then, uh, of course, very popular in the industry is ST-Link or a SMC stub enabled debug hardware, or also a J-Link. And you see here also in this table the typical event streaming that you can stream uh, with 16 byte events. So you can typically stream 6,000 events, 5,000 events with the lower end uh, units a little less. If you have uh, actually events that are missed in the system, there is a command that notifies you about that. Uh, you can see when you have actually missed events so that you know you need to increase the event buffer um, that uh, basically event birds are better captured. Ulink Plus has also isolated debug, um, so it can be used for power conversion algorithms where you probably need isolation or for high sensitive analog uh, applications. Now let me give you some demos. Um, in my first demo project, it does some math calculations using auto threads. Two threads do some sine and cosine numbering, crunching, and another thread calculates prime numbers. And here the event recorder that is available with view analysis windows and then event recorder shows the autos events in a window. You can verify the correct operation and you see the threat execution. Hyperlinks in this window bring you directly to the related documentation. So the system interlinks with the documentation that is related to the software component. You may use few watch windows to display also the RTX um, system information. It shows you the current threat status, and this includes, for example, also the stack usage. Then you can add uh, also event recorder functions to your application code. The simplest variants are the start and stop events that are used for event statistics. In this example, event start D generates a start event for the group D with slot number, in this case zero. Event stop D is the corresponding stop event. The surrounding defines enable the code only when the event recorder is part of the application. Otherwise, the code is excluded. And again, the symbols uh, are underlined to indicate that there is a context link. We just click F1 to open it. When you run the modified application, it shows the start and stop events along with the autos events. And you can filter events by configuring the target event recording. So let me disable all RTX events. And after that, you only record and display start stop events. This setting, of course, reduces the number of events captured and lowers the likelihood of an event buffer overrun. When you open view analysis windows, event statistics, you can see how often this code section has been executed. It also provides you with minimum, maximum, and average execution time. You may have noticed that the start and stop events show the source file information, but you may also output value information. To demonstrate that, I have added event start CV and event stop CV to the code. And these functions have three parameters. The first is again the slot number. The second and third parameter are used to pass program values. 
And now the event statistic window shows multiple groups. This timing profiling is useful when you need to ensure that the program execution is within certain timing boundaries. It helps to identify software problems. And you may save the results to a file, which is useful, for example, for test automation. And my final example, you may also add user annotations with API functions. This one records an event and allows to pass two values to the event recorder. The first parameter is again the event ID. And the second and third parameters are the values to be passed. This annotation now outputs the value of the calculated prime number. For such user events, the event recorder shows per default the event number and the parameters in hex format. But you can add the software component view description file to format the output. So this custom SVD file formats the event uh, 0A01 and shows the prime value in decimal format. Once you added this file to the debugger, the prime number event is shown in the event recorder window with the currently calculated prime number. Similar SVD files we have already formatted for the events for our middleware or for various Autos kernels. So they are already available and give you insight into the operation of complex software. So let me conclude. Um, the event recorder versus printf style debugging. What is the benefit of it? With printf style debugging, you have a um, printf function and it's easy to use. Every programmer has learned that. Event recorder uh, has more features. It has uh, various functions to record events with several parameters. You have also a function that can, um, that can record a data buffer. So it's a bit uh, more feature rich on this side. When you then take a look to the features that already are there with Event Recorder, um, the timestamps are already recorded, either using the debug timer or an Autos timer. You can filter events using the ID so that only essential data are stored. You can configure this at runtime or also at compile time. There are no calling restrictions, so you can call event recorder functions also within interrupt service routines and threads can be intermixed. And uh, the event ID basically avoids that you need ASCII, uh, ASCII string passing. It simplifies continuous integration tests. All these features can be added also to printf, but it requires additional custom code. Um, the data management is ASCII text only. Filtering is typically not as easy as with the event recorder. Now, when you take a look to the resource requirements, then um, also here you see a significant difference. A printf function um, already causes significant overhead. Um, we have measured seven more than seven kilobytes, um, including a newer driver. Um, the event recorder only needs about one kilobyte program code. It needs a little bit more RAM. The RAM uh, requirements for printf are lower, but uh, the event recorder, of course, buffers the events, which then results in a much better execution time performance. You have here an execution time of 1.5 milliseconds um, with a printf event and uh, versus 2.8 microseconds with the event recorder call. This is measured on a Cortex-M4 running a little bit more than 100 megahertz. So, um, and now finally I transition to Perceptio. We have for our event recorder technology also an interface that then uh, interfaces to the Perceptio Tracerlizer. Um, this Tracerlizer again can read our XML description files to decode the events. It works via an, an socket interface, so it has a TCP IP interface to our tooling. 
and basically relies on the technology we have developed. And now I hand over to Johan that will explain the benefits of the Perceptio tools. My name is uh, Johan Kraft. I'm the CEO, CTO and founder of uh, Perceptio. Um, so the title of my presentation today is Visual Trace Diagnostics, Tracealizer in the lab, developed in the field. Uh, what's important to remember, the source code is actually not the full picture. Runtime behavior is what ultimately counts. And the runtime behavior also depends on dynamic effects, like variations in timing and interference between tasks. And these things are not visible or even defined in the source code. Uh, to get a, a full picture, you also need runtime monitoring. You may ask, why bother? If my code passes the testing, well, all should be fine, right? Well, it's not that easy, actually, because these dynamic effects may cause a whole lot of different ex execution patterns under the hood, so to say. Many of these patterns are probably just fine, but some might be buggy and perhaps doesn't even show up in your testing. You can't really know. Um, I will come back and explain a bit more what I mean by these execution patterns. But my point here is that the dynamic stability of your software design is really important for the testing and debugging process. And here's an example from our Tracealizer tool showing four different execution patterns. Uh, this is the same task in FreeRTOS in this case, uh, just with different timing, different event orders. This is just from a very simple toy application. I could find four patterns directly in just a few minutes. I mean, how many patterns could there be in a more complex, realistic application? And I should mention that when you study real-time uh, systems in the university, etc., we're taught that the logic of the application shouldn't be affected by patterns in the scheduling, etc. The artos is intended to take care of that. To you have different stacks, etc., and the context switching makes it appear that the, the task is isolated. But this assumes that the task is really independent, that there are no, no functional dependencies on other tasks and that there are no bugs that could affect this in any way. And you can't assume that. If we assume that the application is bug-free, why do we even test in the first place? So it's, it's, uh, you really need to take this dimension into account. So how do you design an Artos-based software to reduce the, or to improve the dynamic stability, to have fewer patterns, so to say. Uh, there are uh, some things to think about. First, you need to, you should know that it's really difficult to do multi-threaded software development in, in general. This has been a known problem for decades. Th these kinds of bugs can be really tricky and uh, it's difficult to get this right unless you follow kind of best practices, the wisdom that has accumulated in the, in the software industry. I have started on a list here with some advice that can be good to know from very high level things to more detailed things. And throughout the development project, there are a number of pitfalls and things to uh, good advice to follow. And one thing, for instance, is in the very early phase of the project, when you select the processor, it's important that you have sufficient performance and also that if it would turn out that the performance is not sufficient later on, that there is an easy upgrade path. There is a slightly faster processor that is pin compatible, for instance. Another aspect is that your application will probably depend on base software from your vendor, like a middleware vendor or an Artos vendor or 
a processor vendor. You don't write all the code from scratch. You have certain drivers or, or board, a board support package to begin with. And it's not certain that this software is perfect either. You, you really need to ensure that this, uh, th these critical base functions are uh, of high quality and has the performance you need. Before you start hacking away and churning out a lot of application code, it's really important that you make sure you have a sound initial software design, that you have the partitioned your application into suitable tasks, threads, and that they're communicating and interacting in a sound way. Otherwise, it might become a, a big mess after a few months and uh, the project might be uh, prone to failure, actually. Uh, there are a number of best practices in uh, kind of more detailed software design. It's important that the team members are aware of this and follow this throughout the project. If someone starts doing things their own way, uh, disabling interrupts, for instance, to protect a critical section, and other team members are not aware of this, uh, it could seriously impact the system performance. Another example is you shouldn't use busy waiting to have kind of a spin lock uh, where tasks are polling something. Instead, you should, when designing with an RTOS, you should leverage the RTOS functions to suspend the task while waiting. That way other tasks can execute instead and you avoid wasting CPU cycles. Interrupt handlers should be kept to a uh, minimal. Uh, you should do as little processing as possible within interrupt handlers and instead trigger tasks that can run on lower priority and that way you can still receive other interrupts so you have better interrupt response time. When assigning task priorities, this is a really tricky field, actually a whole research field on its own. Uh, there are for instance methods like rate monotonic that you can use to uh, assign priorities to tasks in a way that uh, gives more confidence uh, in the execution so you can be more certain that timing requirements will be met for instance in rate monoto if you apply rate monotonic which means that the priorities should be assigned according to the task rates that is how period how frequently they execute mm -hmm. a task that executes every two milliseconds should have higher priority than a task that executes every 50 milliseconds for instance but to do that, you need to keep track on, on, on the periodicity of the tasks, of course. Uh, there are many more best practices like this. Um, there isn't actually that much written in this area. There are a few books, for instance, by Jean Labrosse and Richard Barry, uh, but they mainly focus on how to use specific uh, features in artosis. There is uh, a blogger called Jacob Beningo that has started an initiative in this direction and written a bit about high-level best practices, how you should break down your design into tasks, etc. Another aspect is that you should make sure you keep track of the software evolution during the development, especially if you are a team of a few developers or more. Then people will start doing things in their own way. And it can be difficult to overview this in the source code. Another thing is that you should make sure to detect and fix any anomalies you see in the software behavior as early as possible. Because otherwise, when the, the behavior gets increasingly complex and these anomalies, if you will, these glitches that you're not quite certain why they are, they will accumulate and make things really difficult for you. And if you have important requirements on performance and timing, make sure to keep track of this, this throughout the project. Start with this as early as possible. Otherwise, it can be really hard to try to optimize this in the end of the project. Perhaps you have some, a task that needs to be able to run every five milliseconds, and it turns out that it takes seven milliseconds to, to run the code. What do you do then? Uh, in general, many of these things uh, benefit a lot or even require that you do runtime monitoring. You can't figure this out just by looking at the source code. So runtime monitoring, what does that mean? Well, 
there are different ways you can do this. Um, this is nothing new. People have monitored their software since the dawn of time. Uh, printf is a common example that you insert printouts in your code at interesting locations. This is uh, what I call application logging here on the right. And this gives you a kind of a semi-structured log. Uh, this is generated uh, in the software. Uh, it's typically on a fairly high abstraction level. Uh, the overhead depends greatly on the method that you use for the output. If you're logging over a, a serial connection, then it might take milliseconds to output a, a printf. If you have that kind of logging, you shouldn't use a printf in any time critical code whatsoever, like an interrupt or high frequency task. Also, the actual printf method consumes a lot of stack and a lot of CPU cycles, so it's not very efficient. On the other end of the spectrum, we have instruction trays. You can capture data directly from the processor core on what uh, branches and jumps that have been made and exactly what instructions that have been executed. The data you get is then very detailed on a low abstraction level. The overhead is typically none, because at least from the software perspective. Uh, the drawback is that you need special, quite expensive hardware. You need to have a cable and a box plug in, plugged in and you need to have a board that is and a processor that allows for this kind of tracing. And also the, the amount of data you get can be quite overwhelming and uh, perhaps too detailed, it doesn't give much overview. Um, and in the middle we have what we call software event tracing or event annotations is another word for it. It's still produced by software instrumentation uh, as in logging, but in a more structured way. Typically you have instrumentation that the vendor provides in the API, something the art does. So you as an application developer don't have to add printouts. You get the information on things like context switching, uh, important API calls, etc. But you can also combine this with the application logging to get both medium and high level events. The overhead is typically less than application logging can be some overhead and depends greatly on the application, how many events you have, etc. And also the processor speed. But typically the overhead is quite small and you don't need any special hardware. So you can actually keep this enabled in deployed systems if you like, uh, or otherwise you can make it very easy for developers to use this. You don't need any special equipment. Once you have the data, th then the question is, how can you m make use of this trace data in an efficient way? We have defined this concept of visual trace diagnostics to try to explain this. This means that you have, you combine event trace data with semantic analysis. That is, that you process the data in a smart way and take the meaning of these events into account. And also combine this with good visualization. This allows for usable, actionable insights throughout the development process. There are many uses of this. I mentioned selecting a processor, for instance. Um, so there are several applications in very early design and prototyping stage. Uh, during application development, for instance, system level debugging, as I will come into soon in verification and also in deployment actually. We have a solution for monitoring deployed systems. Assuming there is some kind of connectivity, we can submit issues to our web service dev alert and alert you when there is a problem in the field. Uh, one example of this very first, very early use case uh, to profile the base software. I mentioned this a few slides ago that your application will depend on important software functions provided by the vendor, like typically in a BSP or middleware, that are actually quite critical for the performance. It could be, say, a function for outputting data on, on a communication protocol, a communication interface. And it might be that your Ethernet connection is capable of 100 megabits per second, 
But if your TCP IP stack or the Ethernet drivers are not of good quality or not really optimized, then the theoretical hardware performance doesn't really matter. The drivers also need to perform. So it's important to check this. So you can use, uh, for instance, Tracealizer to check the timing and also what's going on when you are sending and receiving data, for instance. Here we can see that we are sending and receiving data on a network interface. And you can see that there, there's a lot of activity here in between these the events we have logged. Uh, it's not just a, a simple function, but they, are, they, they trigger other tasks in the TCP IP st stack that runs on higher priority and takes a lot of CPU time. So it's important to keep track of that. Now I have an example for how to use visual trace diagnostics for system level debugging. As you know, debugging can be really difficult when you see an issue in a full system test and you haven't isolated it yet to a single task or a single function for detailed debugging. In this very first stage, when you just see a weird symptom, you really need more information. You need to find clues so you can zoom in on the problem and analyze it more in detail. So in this particular case, we have a multitasking Artos system that has a shared resource. There is a UART for output. Uh, so the system is outputting two different kinds of data from different parts of the application. Mm -hmm. You see this in the example here, we have one output like A, B, C, D, E, etc. And the other called other data. And normally they are on one line each. But in the middle you see that the, the first type of output, A, B, C, D, E, etc. begins. And in the middle it is uh, preempted, interrupted by the other output. So this, the output from the system is essentially corrupted here. Uh, so where do you begin finding a problem like this? Well, we know that the UART is used. So we can record a trace in Tracealizer and make sure that we capture uh, the UART output events, the writes to the, to the UART. So we add an event in the, in the driver, in the UART uh, write function, uh, to make sure we capture all these. This is quite fast. It typically takes some microsecond or so on a 32-bit ARM MCU. If you would do this with an old school printf over a serial connection, it would be perhaps a hundred times slower. So the, the impact of, of doing this kind of logging is really small. On the right side, you see then uh, what we can see in Tracealizer. We see the two different tasks running. These rectangles here show the actual time between context switches and the labels show different uh, API calls that are made and our own custom events. So we can see that we have these two tasks that are outputting this kind of data. But okay, then what? Where is the error? How can we analyze the problem? Well, uh, Tracealizer has a lot of support for what we call exploratory or top-down analysis. We have overviews, visual overviews, that allows you to spot anomalies at a high abstraction level. And then you can zoom in to see more details. So for instance, in this case, we take a look at how the response times of these tasks change over time. This is one example of a dynamic uh, stability issue or a dynamic variation. We see on the right side that each of these data points here corresponds to one execution of either task. And all of a sudden here, we see that there is something different. And if we double click on this data point, we see the corresponding uh, location in the task trace. And we can see what happens. It's, it's quite obvious in this case, but this high priority task is interrupting, preempting the, the lower priority task. And uh, it seems that it's um, doing this while this output is in progress. And that's the reason why we saw that, that uh, this effect in the, in the output. So to fix a problem like this, uh, most of you know that you need some kind of synchronization, a critical section to prevent that uh, the preemption occurs here. Uh, typically you use a mutex for this. And if we do that, if we insert a mutex and uh, we can see in the beginning 
uh, the lower priority task begins to execute now, it takes this mutex, it locks it, and then it continues, performs the output. Actually, the output is performed throughout the function here. This is just logging the parameter. And after a while, we see that the other task is activated by the Artos. It has been waiting for a while. And now it tries to take this mutex as well. But it can't because the mutex is locked. We can see that both tas tasks are trying to access this mutex. And you can also see that what happens here is that the lower priority task actually has the, pri the priorities changed by the artus. It increases the priority on this low priority task. And the reason for this is to avoid a problem known as uh, priority inversion, where um, lower priority tasks may disturb higher priority tasks. Now you can see in the output screen here from the serial terminal that uh, we don't have this corruption problem anymore. You can read more about Tracealyzer at uh, percepio.com slash Tracealyzer. There is a, a free um, evaluation version you can register for and download. And then I would like to mention our new thing, Percepio Dev Alert. This is about error reporting from deployed devices. Today, when you develop device software, we test and test and test and hope for the best, basically. But in practice, there are always a few bugs remaining unless you spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on verification. I mean, even NASA have a few problems now and then. It's really difficult to catch all problems. And I mean, it's actually a theoretical impossibility to know if you have found all bugs, when to stop testing. So we can assume there always is a few bugs remaining, more or less. And it would be really nice if we, we could catch these as soon as possible, because the longer a bug is out there in the field, the more problem it causes, the more systems and users are affected. But with a connected system, some kind of IoT connectivity to, a, say, a cloud service, then we can provide trace data automatically in case of detected errors. When you get the trace, a trace back from the field, then it's much easier for the developers to first to know that there is a problem in the first place, to be aware that, oops, we need to fix something here. And also to diagnose the problem. If you just get a report from a user saying that, oh, my system crashed, it can be quite difficult to, to find the problem. But if you get a trace and see that that task and that task were running and they were doing that and that just before the problem, then it can be much easier. We can't show you all the details, but we can show you a lot and uh, that helps you along. And by, by having this awareness and this diagnostics, you can hopefully fix the problem quickly and make an over there update, and update your devices before most of the users even notice there is a problem in the first place. So Tracealyzer is for the bugs that you um, are aware of, that you know about, and DevAlert is for the bugs that you don't know about yet. Another benefit of this approach with DevAlert is that all the feedback you get is actually important input for your testing. Every bug you get back from the field is something your testing has missed. So that's really important feedback so you can improve your testing to and avoid that similar issues occur in the future. And this can be used for any kind of problem that you can detect in your software. It could be uh, software assertions that fails, like um, sanity checks. It could be um, hard fault exception handlers, watchdog timers, stack overflow detected. Uh, out of memory or you, even that you have more pro proactive warnings that for instance your stack usage have exceeded 90% or something like that. We're also planning to add support for more more proactive reporting or statistics for instance how an application is used by the users what what features that are used and how often and if there are, for instance, usability problems, say that you have a device with a certain uh, setup wizard that the users are expected to 
to perform and perhaps 50% of the users fail because it's too complicated or difficult not explained properly, then it can be important to know that. You can learn more about DevAlert at percepio.com slash DevAlert. Finally, I would like to show you uh, a bit more hands-on uh, what Tracealyzer is and what it can do for you. So here is uh, the default views in Tracealyzer. There are many more, but um, here on the left we see uh, the timeline of the task and interrupt the execution. And we also see events like uh, API calls and custom user events like this one. And uh, as you can see, we have this, horse, uh, this vertical orientation of the timeline to allow for showing events like this. Uh, and what you see here, these tasks, these are the tasks that um, and the solid rectangles are uh, the actual execution, while the shaded areas are time from the activation of the task until it actually, actually begins to execute. Uh, and uh, this blue rectangle here indicates the task instance run from activation to completion. And if you click on an event like this, you can see all related events. For instance, here we see all the mallocs and freeze. And um, if I'm interested in, oops, if I'm interested in um, to see if all allocations have been released, then I can, for instance, select this filter, show remaining only. And here we can see that there are a couple of cases where we have malloc calls that have not been, have a corresponding free. And we can take a look at this graphically, like this, and see how the memory allocation changes over time. And as you can see, we actually seem to have a memory leak in this system. There are malloc and free calls, but some of the malloc calls are not, does not have a corresponding free. Uh, another thing you can see in Tracealyzer is, for instance, the CPU load. Here you see the distribution of the CPU cycles over time, which tasks and interrupts are using most. most. And you can click here to find the corresponding sequences in the trace. Uh, this uh, user event signal plot shows you custom application data that we have logged in what we call user events. In this case, it's a PID motor controller. And you can see how the set position changes. Let's change that to use steps instead. Uh, and we can see how the, this control algorithm performs. You see that there is a certain amount of overshoot here and the motor responds. So Tracealyzer actually integrates many types of data, both uh, art of scheduling, application logging, and performance data into the same uh, graphical interface. Another thing that is uh, pretty cool is this communication flow view that shows you a high level overview of the runtime interactions. This is actually a summary generated from the trace data. And you can see that we have a couple of tasks and interrupts here in the rectangles. And we have synchronization objects like queues could also be mutexes and semaphores and things like that. And we can click here to find all activations of this particular task and the timing metrics. You can see variations in timing here, for instance. Or you can click on a queue and see all these corresponding messages like that. Uh, there is a ton of different features and views you can use in Tracealyzer, but to get started, you can select this all views and get a summary of them all um, and uh, see what you can do with them, learn more or activate a view like that. So if you found this uh, to be of interest, please uh, check out our website, percepio.com. Uh, there is a lot of information here um, in the getting started and uh, 
the Artist Debug Portal has a lot of interesting material, blogs, articles, etc., hands-on guides, and you can also download Tracealizer for evaluation. Thank you. So we are now at the end of our presentations. Um, you have now the chance to raise questions um, via the system. You can also get more information on various websites. Um, on kyle.com, there's a specific page about the event recorder. Perceptio um, has, of course, also the way to reach per email. Um, and uh, Johan did explain the various channels before in his part. So thank you for attending this webinar and I wish you a good day.